Hello and welcome to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. We're here at the State House today on May 12th. It's allegedly the adjournment day for this year's session. And we're here to talk with some legislators about what they've accomplished this year, as well as get a feel for uh, the crunch time at the end of the session and what folks are trying to get past here in the final hours of the legislative session this year. So thanks for joining us on Under the Dome. So Emma, do you want to just talk a little bit, we'll start with um, what you've been working on this session and a couple of things that you've accomplished this session that you're excited about. Great. Well, thanks for coming to the State House on these final days of the session. Um, it's been a, a long several weeks, and so I'm excited to uh, report that we've had a couple significant labor bills come forward. Uh, I'm the leader of the Progressive Caucus, and so we had a few big priority areas and labor issues and workers' rights were what was one of that piece of um, work. And so we just recently passed a provision on workplace discrimination and harassment, S-103. And within that bill, there's also an update finally after 20 years to the equal pay provisions of state law. Uh, equal pay right now until this law, uh, bill gets, gets signed by the governor uh, only extends to people's biological sex. It's uh, an old and outdated terminology anyway, even when we talk about gender identity. But there's so many other categories of identities people hold um, that impact b based on implicit or explicit bias that impact how people are paid in the workplace. So this is an incredibly important update. And now will include race, national origin, gender identity, sexual orientation, and disability. So it, it, it also adds a layer of privacy for employees so employers can actively ask what's your identity in order to then you know, make sure they're not paying um, wages differently based on identity. So it's a major move forward for uh, just for economic justice in the workplace. The other provisions in there um, change the standard of harassment in the workplace uh, from severe and pervasive, which is a very high standard to prove if you're being harassed in the workplace um, and it has dropped it to a reasonable level so people can actually be more protected in the workplace uh, so those, that's a major move forward for just employment rights there would you like me to talk about another one um, I think I'm gonna jump okay, into uh, another yeah, so yep so the legislature is considering a few really big ticket items as we're approaching the, the, the end of this session here there's a child care bill there's the budget um, what are you hoping to accomplish in the last couple of hours and um, how, what do you kind of anticipate will, or, or what are you looking forward to as the, as we approach the finish line here? Yes. Well, one of the biggest bills um, we have left is child care policy. Unfortunately, we were not able to get paid family leave across the finish line this session. We have next session. I see the two issues as really intertwined for working families. So I am actually disappointed that we could not find between the Senate and the House working co collaboratively together, a solution that put both pieces forward because that's the bold policy that working families need. However, child care, we have had a crisis for years and we are finally on the precipice of having a real um, bold piece of policy go forward that will increase CCFAP, which is a subsidy program uh, for Vermonters to a much higher lo income level to allow people who are sort of that upper lower income or even lower middle income range to get some economic support so people aren't going to be paying such an, um, a huge amount of their income for childcare. It also puts meaningful resources towards childcare workers so we can retain and retract and pay decently and fairly livable wages for for staff. Um, it also has provisions in there that start to just make the program, we talked last time we had did an interview around language access, so some of the components of the CCFAP program are very opaque and very hard to navigate for paperwork, etc. So one of the provisions in this bill aligns the new state language access plan requiring all the forms and paperwork that um, uh, AHS through the De uh, Department of Children and Families puts through these programs, making those forms accessible for the average Vermonter, for any Vermonter for that matter, so it's plain language and easy to access and navigate. So it's, I'm actually quite excited about the policy in there. Now it will include a payroll tax, which was a compromise with the Senate. 
And so the funding mechanism is really important here as we think about everyone paying into this system to support the childcare needs of our working economy. And so I think that's another really important piece there because everyone's in now on making sure that this is an important step forward, a statement from Vermont um, that this impacts all employers, impacts all workers. And when, you know, when the workforce does not have affordable childcare, it has negative outcomes on all aspects of our economy. A lot of moving pieces here at the end of the session as deals are, you mentioned a compromise in the child care bill. Can you characterize just a little bit of what it looks like for a deal or a compromise to be made? How does that work? Does the leadership kind of conference and then come back to other folks in, in each chamber or do you have a, you know, a chance to weigh in on an email thread or something? Like how does it, how does it work? That's a great question to like sort of make it a little more transparent of all the, the very uh, complicated moves that happen as we round up the session. So I would say some of the pieces um, are more formal looking like sometimes uh, when the Senate and House cannot compromise on a bill they'll call a committee of conference which then there's three members from the House and three members in the Senate it's usually people who are in leadership roles of committees come together this is what happens all the time with the budget for example and then work for either a day or several days to work out a compromise and when that goes through that process the bill that comes back to both chambers is an up-down vote meaning we don't get to further amend it um, and you get a yes no which is not my favorite part of this job the binary yes no I think every vote is to ask it's like a yes with a major asterisk or a no with a major asterisk to explain why this is not just a simple yes or a simple no. Um, but that's like the most formal straightforward way. Many other ways um, are behind the scenes and back and forth and uh, a really good example is the child care bill for example. So if, if viewers are looking for S56 which for until about two days ago was the child care bill to be tracking, you will not find it anymore. I mean you'll find it but it looks like we have done nothing with it because also what happens at this point is must pass legislation and gets things put into it in order to be a vehicle to get it past the finish line, especially if there's further amendments to happen to it. And so the child care bill is in this other bill now, H217, which ironically enough was originally a workers' compensation and unemployment bill, which went through my committee. So there's lots of ways to get things to the finish line. It can get very hard to track. And so one of the best things anybody viewing at home who's really curious about it and passionate about a particular topic or bill is to talk to their legislator because at this point, probably a good half of the bills that you think were moving it may look like it didn't move, but it actually did move in another vehicle, which is just another bill. It's, it doesn't have to be that complicated, but when we, need, when we have a deadline of getting out of the building after 18 weeks of work, this is what happens. Um, but, uh, but that's, I mean, that's part of the process. Yeah. Do you think you'll be done by the end of the day? I am crossing all my fingers and toes. However, I do want to say a big however, we need to do some good work. And so sometimes the thing I really hate about the end of the process here is we rush the work. I've equated it to being like a lab partner and showing up and doing all the hard work. And then someone shows up at the 11th hour who was supposed to be 50% of the grade as well. And they didn't do very good work, quality work. And I think that reflects in our policy sometimes. So Seth, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what you've worked on this session and what committee you're in? Sure. Uh, so I'm in government operations and military affairs. Um, the uh, it, There's an awful lot of stuff that goes through our committee. Anything to do with any changes to any town or city charter, um, water districts, etc. So there's a lot of volume. Um, some of the big things we've been working on this year are specifically sheriff's reforms um, related to the Franklin County situation. Um, we've been doing a crash course in uh, impeachment and how that works um, for both uh, the sheriff and uh, uh, attorney Lavoie. Um, we've also been digging into uh, uh, updates to liquor laws, cannabis reform, um, election laws in general. Um, one of the ones that I've worked on uh, specifically is a cybersecurity council because a lot of the different industries and stuff in the state have uh, diverse cybersecurity <laughs> um, and trying to find uh, especially our more vulnerable uh, institutions like power, water, etc. Um, and getting them up to a, an equal level of standard and communicating across industries. So setting that up is, uh, it, it didn't cause an awful lot of discussion, but it's important uh, work and getting uh, the council stood up so that everybody can communicate and, and begin the work of standardizing. So we're here on the last day of the session and it's a little bit chaotic. And so uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what your role as a representative is now, sort of as, as we come to the end and some of these big ticket bills are being considered by the House and Senate and what that might look like and, and what your role is today? 
Sure. Uh, for our committee, the two that are still in play are elections reforms and cannabis reforms, uh, ad updating the, the rules and, and regulations with things that we've learned since it was first launched. Uh, those are both coming over from the Senate, so we have yet to hear the, the full report of what those will look like. So our committee will be uh, reconvening to, to discuss those shortly. Um, and once we figure out if, if we approve or if there's additional changes, then they go to the floor. Uh, if it's something that is broadly supported by all members of the party and the caucus and the, the body as a whole, um, then the, the parties will cooperate to provide rules uh, suspensions to allow things to be taken up in a more timely manner. If there's disagreement, then it goes through the traditional process of going on notice calendar, which means we wouldn't be able to take it up today. So uh, there is kind of a chaotic air to the state house today as we're all finishing things up. Is there anything that you wish were different about the legislative process that could allow this work to um, take shape more sort of intentionally, or you know, is is there something that you wish were different about the process? Yeah. Um, We've heard from a lot of folks different desires for what the session would look like. I happen to be in the camp. I'm a technology guy, so I'm a network engineer. A lot of the, the topics that I deal with are very rapid evolving, right? So I would like to see a longer session or like year round or something like that so that we don't have this crunch at the end. Uh, we would still have a, an end date of the year uh, for timeline, but um, having a longer duration session or maybe a more stretched out session so we can respond to things as they come up in the lives of Vermonters, I think would be helpful to the process. Can you just share a, a couple of things that you've worked on this session that you're excited about? Yes, in health and welfare, we did some great work this year. One of the things we got to do was we took a uh, field trip to Jenna's Promise, which is a, um, a community organization in Johnson, Vermont, that is designed with wraparound services um, for folks who are struggling with addiction. And it was probably the best day or one of the best days that I had in the Senate, just um, connecting with these folks who've really created a culture and a community that destigmatizes addiction, that helps folks deal with this disease, um, helps them find work, helps them learn a skill, um, provides medical care. It was just an incredible day for me and um, that was just a wonderful example of kind of like a hub and spoke uh, system with wraparound services that protects and supports people. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. Um, and H-222, which is a bill that is somewhat related to the work of Jenna's Promise, which is really going to save lives and going to help folks suffering from addiction disorder. Uh, there are lots of parts to the bill, um, and I won't go into all of them, but that is work that I'm really proud of. And S-89, the SHIELD bill, which will um, really protect um, doctors who are supporting folks um, with um, reproductive health care as well as gender affirming care. So I'm really excited about that work. Um, also in Senate education we passed um, the universal meals bill, school meals bill, which um, I was a little hesitant about at first because I was worried about the money coming out of the education fund, which is already very stressed and um, there's so much that we need in the way of education that I was concerned with that money coming out. But after a lot of testimony and learning about um, the importance of, of this particular system, I certainly came around, I voted for it, and I'm happy that it passed. So, um, yeah. That's great. So it sounds like as of this week, there's a deal between the House and the Senate to move forward some pretty historic investment in child care in Vermont. Um, can you talk a little bit about that compromise that took place this week and what that means for child care in Vermont and also whether it looks like that might be able to survive a governor's veto as it looks like Governor Scott is probably not going to support the bill? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I think everyone knows that the House was more focused on paid family leave, which was a which was a large uh, bill also with a lot of pieces to it. The Senate was more focused on child care. Um, I think it's great that the two bodies got together and worked out a compromise um, and that child care has survived. I do believe that we will be able to... Um, you know, I think we do have a veto-proof majority on this bill. That's my sense. Who knows? But um, I think it just has a lot of support, and there's a lot of um, outreach from the public just asking us to get this done. So um, I think there's a lot of motivation. What does deal-making and compromise look like sort of as we approach this hard and fast deadline? It's the end of the session. Adjournment's probably going to be later today. Um, you know, how do you, how does, how do legislators navigate making those deals on that deadline? What does it look like? Is it, are deals kind of happening in back rooms? How do, you know, how do senators and legislators and representatives actually be, you know, how are they able to weigh in on these kinds of compromises as they take place really quickly? That's a really great question. And as someone who is brand new at this, my answer is just from the perspective of someone who is new and I can say that there are times when I wish there were a little bit more there was a little more transparency in these final weeks because there is a lot of work that's going on um, that you know I didn't necessarily understand or wasn't necessarily a part of I understand um, you know it takes years to really understand all of the parliamentary rules and all of the inner working inner workings of the system um, but uh, that said um, it does seem as though both bodies and basically everyone who's here is determined to come to a resolution to find a solution listen to constituents listen to the big issues out in the public and get to an end point and that is um, it gives me hope for democracy <laughs> So it looks like the budget that's going to pass today does not uh, extend the emergency housing program that has supported almost 3,000 folks through the pandemic being housed in motels around the state. Um, how do you expect or hope that the state government will support those people as they potentially lose their housing in July? Yeah, that was um, a very sad and disturbing uh, piece of news as we as we went through these final weeks. Um, housing, if nothing else, is an upstream investment. If you can get folks housed, it saves you a lot of time, energy, resources, pain downstream. So I'm saddened that we weren't able to find or haven't found the money to house these folks until we have a solution. That said, I also have to listen to my colleagues who have said that a lot of the money that was going into this temporary program will be placed into wraparound services, long-term housing solutions. But I wish instead of an and or, it was an and and. You know, we're doing this and we're doing this other thing um, because um, I am very concerned. Um, and we received very compelling emails from a lot of folks who are in that program. And I worry for their safety and their well-being. So, Paul, can you just tell us a little bit about the ranked choice voting bill that's moving through the legislature this year and where it's at right now on the last day of the session? Sure. Well, the Senate has now twice passed legislation that includes ranked choice voting, and that would put ranked choice voting in place for the 2028 presidential primary in Vermont. Um, the reason why they passed it twice is because the first bill that they passed hasn't yet gotten out of committee in the House. The House, in the meantime, sent another bill to the Senate about that has broader election reforms in it. So the Senate today debated that legislation and attached to that the ranked choice voting provisions that they had passed earlier. Uh, so that broader package of election reforms uh, just passed the Senate on a 16 to 14 vote. Okay. And um, does that uh, will that make it back to the House before the end of the session today, do you think? That's an excellent question. <laughs> it may depend on how long uh, they're here. If they leave today, the answer is no. That was just second reading in the Senate today, so it needs to be passed for a third and final time. Uh, and then uh, because of the changes that the Senate made, it would need to go back to the House for their consideration and, and probable concurrence if they had the opportunity. But, uh, but they, from what I'm hearing, they won't have the opportunity before they break um, uh, today or even tomorrow wouldn't be enough time for that to happen.
Um, <laughs> uh, do you think that it's good for Vermont's democracy that these uh, have been kind of bundled together, or would you have liked to see uh, ranked choice voting move forward separately? Um, I, I tend to think it's good for these uh, measures to be considered on their own merits, um, and certainly we would we would love to see ranked choice voting considered uh, on its merits. The bill that is currently in the House of Representatives. Um, what we saw on the floor today in the Senate was um, uh, concern over. Uh, several other provisions in the bill. Um, I, I don't think any any senators ra uh, raised any objections to the ranked choice voting provisions today. Um, it doesn't mean that it, the whole thing cannot happen. It, it did pass 1614, and um, and, it, and it has some good things in it, and it has some things that uh, a number of senators, who uh, I think raised legitimate concerns um, about elements of it. Uh, we felt that on balance, uh, as an overall package, uh, we did support it, um, and our primary interest was the ranked choice voting piece, um, but uh, we urged uh, senators to vote in favor, and, um, and a bare majority did. Yeah, slim majority. Do you think that the governor has is, is going to support this bill as well? It's unclear, uh, for sure. Um, he has um, expressed some concerns about ranked choice uh, in the past, uh, though, the, again, that bill had a 23 to 7 uh, vote earlier in the session, and I expect uh, it would receive uh, well over 100 votes in the House if that were to go uh, as, a, as a separate bill on its own merits. Um, I don't know that I've heard the governor speak to the other elements of this bill, though clearly uh, there were, again, these other concerns raised, so we just don't know where the governor is going to come down on it. Um, that um, you know, any observer would say that raises questions uh, about whether this has a, a chance of moving uh, because 16 is not 20, uh, and that's what you need for an override. So, uh, so we don't know. But um, you know, as an organization that's concerned about getting more people involved in elections, giving voters more choices and a stronger voice in the process, we're going to keep moving forward every day we can. We'll try to make this process better, more inclusive uh, for as many voters as possible. I want to speak about briefly any of the other things that VPIRG has been working on this session that you're excited about? Well, it's, it's actually been a pretty good session in a number of ways. Uh, a, a bill that just came out of the Senate yesterday was the bottle bill legislation to expand the scope of the 51-year-old uh, popular bottle bill program in the state. So that's the program that you pay a, a five-cent deposit on uh, beverage containers. You get that deposit back when you bring them back for redemption. And it has recycled over the 50 years of the program more than 10 billion cans and bottles in the state. It's good for recycling. This legislation would also improve redemption opportunities for people, adding more redemption centers around the state. So it would be good for consumers, good for small businesses, and good for the environment. So we are certainly hopeful that that bill might make it all the way through. Um, it, uh, that, too, is in a situation right now where the two chambers are working out uh, differences. Could possibly happen uh, if there is a veto override session. It, those differences could be worked out at that time, um, and and we be hopeful that the governor might be uh, willing to uh, to let that one pass. Um, and uh, I think that would be a huge environmental victory for folks. It's sort of crunch time here at the end of the session. How does sort of the deal making, the compromising work at this point? There's, everything's moving so quickly, and you know, advocates like yourselves are. Um, trying to move certain legislation forward. How does it work? Are there sort of email threads that you're chiming in on? Are there, you know, rooms that you're trying to, um, you know, come into? Or is a lot of the work that you've done this session kind of already behind you? Like, what's your role today on the last day of the session in getting some of this stuff passed? Well, we're here in the building, and that means sharing information, um, thoughts, trying to answer questions that legislators may have on particular pieces of legislation. Uh, we've worked on uh, dozens of bills um, through the course of the session, and invariably, it is the final days where those bills are trying to get ultimately across the finish line. And so there are a lot of conversations with a lot of legislators on many different issues. A lot of good and valid questions being raised because you, you have, you're talking about legislators who spend most of their time in one or two committees. They get very uh, steeped in those issues that are before the committees. But all the rest of these issues they're hearing about on the floor or trying to gather information from lobbyists or other interested parties in the building. By and large, they have no staff of their own. And so again, 
again, there are a lot of questions that they reasonably have uh, that we and others are trying to answer um, at this point in the session. And then counting votes, you know, or do we have enough votes to pass this bill? And, um, uh, and, and trying to, again, just help the process move forward as best we can. That's a lot of what you're seeing in the building at this stage of the game. For an organization like mine, a nonprofit that has many members from around the state, we're also keeping those members informed about where we are in the process on each of these individual bills and trying to give them the opportunity to connect with their legislators at just the right time with just the right message. Representative Stebbins, thank you so much for joining us. So can you talk just a little bit about what you've worked on, what committee you're in this session, and um, what legislation you've been working on? Sure, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. So I serve on the House Environment and Energy Committee. Um, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Climate Solutions Caucus, and I'm also a co-chair of a statewide uh, climate workforce collaborative group. Um, so great to be in the committee that I'm in because it's so relevant to a lot of the additional work that I do. Um, to focus first in terms of what our committee worked on, uh, hopefully we're going to vote out two bills on the floor in about 10 minutes, one on household hazardous waste, uh, and then one also on sort of pulling all the stakeholders together to develop uh, a, a thoughtful biodiversity plan to really look at how we protect Vermont moving into the future. Um, keeping in mind that 70% or so of Vermont is privately owned. So this is a really uh, critical conversation that has to be done in a really thoughtful way. Uh, Vermonters love living here because it's gorgeous and beautiful and because we care about our neighbors. Um, so how do, we, how do we work with our neighbors when they want to, when they are willing to talk about what do we want Vermont to look like in 2030 and 2050? We also just passed yesterday, we uh, uh, managed to flip the governor's veto on S5, the Affordable Heat Act. Uh, as someone who's worked in energy and environmental issues since 2000, um, you know, the one of the top sectors besides transportation in Vermont for carbon emissions is how we heat our buildings. So this has been a really challenging, uh, challenging sector to get at. Uh, we've been studying climate change and emissions in Vermont for about two decades, uh, and this concept is drafted a fair amount um, on other performance standards. We have a performance standard in Vermont called a renewable performance standard. Uh, and that is essentially what this is, but it's for the fuels that we use to heat our homes. Um, it's very detailed and I'm happy to talk through any of it with anyone. Uh, I will just say there's gonna be a whole lot of public process about the bill for viewers in case they've heard anything concerning. And I also just want to make it very clear that the bill, essentially what it does is tell all the economists, the energy experts, the engineers, uh, utility experts to develop a program over the next year and a half, um, but then in January 2025, they bring that program design back to the legislature for four and a half months of discussion, review, testimony, uh, and if the legislature votes to approve it then, that's when we would actually see this program go into effect. So Vermonters probably aren't going to see much about this program over the next year and a half, except unless they want to get involved in the public engagement process. Uh, we've also... Um, Hopefully, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we'll be able to modernize uh, our 50-year-old bottle bill. Um, we've also worked on aquatic invasive species in our water bodies and uh, a slew of other bills. We have asked uh, experts and stakeholders to come together to figure out over the next three, four, five months what an update to our renewable portfolio standards should look like. So that's just in my committee, um, quite a bit of work. In terms of writ large, um, you know, uh, we, we passed uh, a suicide prevention bill, a gun safety bill. Um, that was that was really quite a large lift. Uh, we also are uh, hopefully about to pass through childcare uh, and making sure that we are actually building a robust system so families can afford to work here and and raise kids here. Um, and obviously, uh, we're in the last 
hopefully last day. Uh, and one of the things that we're really digging through is how do we make sure that we are planning and preparing as much as possible for July 1, which is when the uh, general assistance, the motel housing program ends after three years from COVID and predominantly federal dollars. Uh, we've been spending, um, you know, the, the administration has uh, approved, it's almost like $8,000 a month per room. So it's, it's a program that we can't keep going like that. A motel is not a home. Um, we do need to shift out of that uh, approach. On the other hand, uh, simply saying you're out does not work either. So that's what's going on today in terms of talking through the budget. How do we make sure that we have an, uh, you know, a ramp that shifts from motel, um, here we are, May 12th, to where we're going to be on July 1st. And, you know, as so many people know, homelessness is not just not having a house. A lot of times it relates to, uh, you know, having uh, medical issues, uh, having, um, uh, you know, substance uh, use disorders. So it's not just do we have enough housing it's do we have the housing and the services so uh, a lot of different committees have worked on different parts of that from healthcare to human services even in my committee we worked on s100 which is really uh, geared to uh, make it um, less uh, make there be fewer regulatory barriers to building um, in locations in Vermont that have water and sewer lines uh, because they're you know for, for any developer uh, they will tell you that there are a lot of steps a lot of regulations we need those um, because that's how we make sure buildings are built safely and we're not doing it in a wetland that ends up getting flooded. On the other hand, are there opportunities that we can really prioritize uh, in town villages in you know city centers that we can make it a little bit easier uh, or, or more efficient to go through that regulatory process. So last day here, it feels like there's sort of a chaotic push to get across some of the largest investments of this session here in the final hours. Is there anything that you wish was different about the legislative process? Is there anything that needs to change so that we can give some of these big issues the time that they need to um, to, to be addressed? Definitely. Uh, this could only start in the Senate, the way our Constitution is written, but I would propose we really look seriously at uh, a unicameral system. So there are other states that only have one body. Um, so that we have one body and we don't have 180 legislators. And instead of meeting for four and a half months and then kicking a whole bunch of work to the off session July through December um, that we actually meet for the amount of time that is needed and we actually have people who uh, are able to give these topics give these policy questions and challenges the time that they need rather than saying okay we ran out of time let's have uh, you know this working group this committee this blue ribbon council <laughs> dig into it there are times where that makes a lot of sense I think for the renewable portfolio standard that I just mentioned makes a lot of sense um, because citizen legislators do not necessarily have the expertise when it comes to like how much solar how much out of state uh, you know other renewables and how much efficiency like we're not necessarily experts in all those areas um, but our challenges are becoming more more interconnected um, as I mentioned housing homelessness um, drug issues uh, mental health concerns uh, physical disabilities we're, we're having more and more challenges that are interwoven and when they're interwoven you can't just silo them up and sort of deal with them in a really neat way you actually have to really dig into the details and that takes time so yes I would do that I actually I I, I also think it would address some of the concerns that we heard about um, increasing legislators pay uh, if we you know if we cut the legislator and legislature in half or, or to like 70 or 80 people um, we would be able to recruit a much more diverse uh, set of representatives than we currently can uh, a lot of people can only serve here if for me I have a husband who works full-time um, and I have a flexible employer um, but it's it's a it's a big uh, a a big ask. Um, I have a five and a 13 year old, you know, they're, they're always like, when are you coming home? Um, so if we want a more diverse legislature that really reflects Vermont, then we need to actually really think about what we think our legislature 
should how it should be structured. So the House is or the legislature is considering a budget bill which does not include uh, funding to continue the emergency housing program that was starting during COVID. You want to uh, just tell us a little bit about what you hope that the legislature would do or will do to support those families. Yeah. So when when. The state shut down for the COVID-19 pandemic. We offered housing in hotels and motels for those who were unhoused in an effort to protect public health in order to qu quarantine people so people could be quarantined and be safe. And we essentially ended homelessness as we knew it at the time. And we have had an opportunity to invest a massive amount of money, an unprecedented amount of federal funds into housing, but we have not moved fast enough. And unfortunately, we've spent over $150 million on these hotels for the last two years without building enough housing for people in the hotels to move into on a permanent basis. And people are concerned about that ongoing expense, and so the general assistance program is being gutted in the current state budget without a plan in place to house people. And so as we end one public health emergency, we're about to create another one because the mass eviction of 2,800 people to the streets is going to be a humanitarian crisis. And when B the city of Burlington evicted the Sears Lane encampment, there were 30 to 40 people living there but they had a safety net. The state offered them hotels. In this case, we have enough people to fill 70 Sears lanes with no plan in place to keep people safe. And people are concerned about the cost of continuing the program, but they're not looking at the cost of the eviction. That hospital room visits are over $1,000 a night. H hospital stays, incarceration, all of these expenses will go up when we evict people from hotels because housing is a social determinant of health and it's a social determinant of crime. So we will see a wave of crime and illness spread through the community because of this mass eviction, not only impacting the individuals in the hotels and the families in the hotels, but the neighborhoods and the communities surrounding the hotels and across the state. And what I would like to see us do is guarantee housing for the next year for the people in the hotels with, an, with a path forward to housing for all. So we buy as many of these motels as we can up front. For example, one of the motels is for sale for 2.1 million with 77 rooms. That would, that's gonna cost us 4.1 million to rent. We save half the money just by buying that hotel and we have that moving forward as an emergency shelter. We can place people in mobile homes and mobile home parks where there's vacant lots with some of the money. And what I, we really need to do is identify public land near the hotels and rapidly develop it and build housing for three times as many people that are in the hotels. So we're not just rehousing people in the hotels, but we're building housing for people who want to move around Vermont or move to Vermont because employers can't even find workers because there's no housing for people who want to move to Vermont. So I see what we can do is take the same amount of money we would have spent on hotels for a year and we can guarantee housing and rapid, rapidly reinvest that money into permanent and temporary housing that includes supportive housing, transitional options. If it, where there's a will, there's a way. And we can do this instead of turning our backs on people and casting them into the shadows um, and throwing away the, all the money we've spent so far in guaranteeing housing. Um, also, what people fail to see is that it's not only housing, but other social determinants of health, like structural conflict, the stress that people experience when the system's geared against them, inclusion and belonging and discrimination and violence of the state, and because this is an act of state violence, we can't get around that. But also the increased violence people will experience from being unhoused and the increased violence in the community will see from the tension this creates that by investing in housing for all now, using this as a moment to turn the page in history, we can address multiple deter social determinants of health with the same cost. So I, there's a bill that I've been working on for many years. Um, that is a towing bill of rights, and it deals with um, the fact that Vermont has unregulated towing regulations, and so many people in my district, but it affects people all over the state, have been 
affected by the fact that we have unregulated towing regulations. So I just got a letter from someone in Worcester who was in a car accident and his car had to be towed and he didn't have insurance that covered towing and the towing place was closed on the weekend. So he picked his car up three days later and it was a thousand dollars for a tow. And it was like two and a half miles, I think. So, uh, Ver so Vermont um, right now allows uh, private uh, tows that aren't municipally driven to be at any rate for towing and for storage. And we allow towers to go out and look for cars to tow. So what I'm really excited about is the Transportation Committee passed um, in one of their bills, S-99, a study that the Attorney General's office will be doing and bringing the results back to the Commerce Committee and the Transportation Committee in December so that hopefully we can pass um, some protections for consumers related to rates, damage, um, and the really unusual part about Vermont's laws is that the tower can, through a legal process, get the title of the car um, within 28 days from the Department of Motor Vehicles if somebody had a non-consensual tow and didn't, um, so if they didn't pay up or the other issue is that it goes to the last registered address of the car. So people that move a lot, students, people who were precariously housed, don't always remember to send their registration in. And so if they don't get that registration, they don't even get the notice that their car is being um, transferred the ownership. And the tower can sell the car and the contents and keep 100% of it. And so that's something that many other states have changed. I've been working on this forever. And I'm just so grateful that it has finally um, getting some <clears throat> traction, no, no pun intended. And um, it's a pretty robust committee and a list of questions. And I'm just so thrilled. Um, to see that move. Um, a bill in the House Judiciary that I introduced and it has passed the House, it is in the Senate Judiciary, is a bill that would make it possible for somebody who's been a victim of the non-consensual removal of a condom to take civil action. So basically, stealthing or the non-consensual removal of a condom is something that has become a thing over the past decade, although it's existed longer, it's happening a lot. I've heard from a lot of constituents. Um, it's very popular in, on college campuses. Um, and actually, my daughter had heard that California passed a law and had said to me, you should think about putting this in. So um, the bill went in. It passed the House. Um, we had one of my colleagues very bravely talked about being a victim of stealthing. And in addition to obviously being at risk of a pregnancy, it's like a violation, you know, like you agree yeah. to have sex to, like, with somebody who's agreeing to wear a condom and they sneakily take it off. There are websites devoted to those practices, like how to get away with it. People can get horrible sexually transmitted diseases that can like really, um, be serious and so this bill wouldn't make it a crime it would make it a civil action so somebody could go and sue for damages and including uh, emotional damage as well as real damage so I was thrilled to pass the house i um, I have heard from a lot of people who are so grateful and I sure am hoping we can get it through the Senate next year so there are a lot of big bills that are Kind of coming up against the deadline here on adjournment day there are you know some of our largest investments in the session the budget the child care bill are up against the deadline here um how do you anticipate what do you anticipate will um is will be you know the fate of those bills how do you participate and other representatives participate in the negotiations you know when we're down to the wire like this in such a time crunch and do you think that the process should look a little bit different you know are, are we um, you know, putting our biggest investments through a process that needs a little bit more uh, breathing room. So it's interesting because I think a lot about how things unfold at the end of session. And one of the things that's so hard is, um, and I, I don't have a solution of 
how to do it differently. But when things go to conference committee, frequently decisions are made quickly. I mean, they are made quickly. And I'm not sure we're fully thinking about the ramifications of them. And while conference committees are open to the public, only the few people on each side really have the say. And when those conference committee reports hit the floor, we can't amend them. It's up or down. And so that's really painful. And at times it's concerning that a lot of work that went into something can be changed so quickly in a negotiation. And one vivid example that I will give you is the um, the suicide prevention bill that had a safe storage component. So one thing that's really well documented in the evidence is that when you lock up guns um, unloaded and the ammunition separately, that's like one of the um, Gun, the sensible gun measures that has been shown to make a really big difference related to children getting hold of guns and using them. So I was so excited that we were doing that piece of legislation. The bill came back from the Senate having us, um, the safe storage meant locking up a gun that was loaded or it could be loaded. And, and it's like, so I started quickly looking up okay, like who does that? Um, even the NRA website page talks about it's safest to remove the ammunition from the gun before you lock it up. So things like that, it's like there's no, it was either this is better than current law because right now we have no safe storage, so I will be supporting it versus why are we going with something that does not make any sense? Like nobody, it's New Hampshire passed that law. So that's why the Senate or whoever was representing uh, the conference committee did that. So I would love to see us change rules so that there could be more because it does feel like um, one thing that's always important to me is looking at the evidence when I'm trying to decide how to vote on something in committee and on the floor and 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 trying to decide really quickly if if I'm going to support, is it better than what currently exists? Does it make sense? Is, is, so, so that's hard. Um, it's unfortunate the budget is the last thing that we do. Um, I don't know if that has to be that way. Um, and I'm trying to learn, I've been trying to learn today because there are some things in the budget that I'm having a very difficult time with yeah. like what I can be doing at the last minute right now. Right, right. And one of those things um, you mentioned in the budget bill, um, the budget does not include funding to continue the emergency housing program that is supporting almost 3,000 Vermonters that are at risk of losing their home in July. So can you talk about how the state government might support um, those folks or how um, you know the process could have unfolded differently to support those, pe those people? Sure. So again, I know um, the House had a very different um, sort of um, belief than the Senate did, and I do not sit in on those meetings. I am a social worker by training. I have spent um, my entire career working in the nonprofit sector, including working at programs that did transitional housing and um, a homeless shelter. So I know when people go into transitional housing, at the very day one, you're talking about, this is temporary housing, where are you going? I realized the motel program didn't get set up because we as a society care about the homeless, because this was federal money. It was about keeping people from spreading COVID, really. Um, and we know that some people who are homeless don't necessarily want to be housed, but that is not the case of the people who are living in the motel. So I have been on the phone today talking to the director of COTS, um, talking to some of the cap um, stone agencies and looking at could we, I mean, having that many people hit the streets in a two month period is going to be extremely taxing on Vermont and I'm worried about that. Um, the chair of appropriations made a wonderful analogy today about how Vermont can come together. We did it with Irene. And so one of the questions I asked was, can we have a czar of smooth transition? I'm not saying we should keep people in motels permanently. 
but let's fan it out over four to six months so that we're not trying to find a good landing place for that many people. A lot of the people who are in motels are in recovery or struggling with recovery or struggling with other issues, and it doesn't have to... It doesn't have to be a crisis. And so one of the things I'm trying to figure out again is how can we make things as smooth as possible? Can we designate someone in state government who's going to help pull things together? Um, I was asking, does COTS need more money to keep the, sh the day station open longer hours? Do they, can they be at full capacity? Do they have enough staff? Like what, what other things can we be doing? And I think all of us, in the state house, need to be um, advocating for people because I think a lot of my colleagues have not um, gotten to know anyone who is homeless, and there are so many reasons why people are homeless, and it's not about people trying to live off, you know, the government or, you know, I used to work with people who are on. Um, the welfare to work program and it's like they're on a gravy train there's no gravy it's not this people we can't legislate to the lowest common denominator these are our f neighbors our community members and um we any of us could end up in that situation and we need to show compassion and help people to land in a good spot and not just assume that Oh, they'll find a place. Maybe they were sleeping on their cousin's couch. But, like, that's not, no one's going to, that's not a long-term solution. There were 700 kids that we're talking about. And we're, I moved here from big states a long time ago. We can, like, it's not that many people. We can figure out a way to help, you know, everybody land somewhere. I'm glad we're looking at permanent housing. I wish that, um... The governor's office or the administration had negotiated a sensible rate with motels because having worked in the nonprofit sector, um, I know that like COTS, I don't know if what the, this is a couple of years old now, but they hadn't gotten an increase in how much they were getting reimbursed in like 10 years to um, house somebody overnight. And we're turning to the motels and saying, name your price and we're gonna pay it, while um, the nonprofit sector is struggling to you know, pay the bills and give their staff increased wages and pay increased healthcare costs. So, so we, um, I think getting rid of the stigma that comes with being homeless, which again also goes back to people who struggle with addiction or any kind of mental health struggle are, are so important and sort of at the crux. It's easy for people to judge, but like we need to all show compassion and like walk. Let's, you know, think about what it's like for the people that are living in a motel room and now know they're, you know, where are they going to go? Where's their stuff going? What's, you know, what's, how are they going to, take their medication or try to get a job if they don't have um, electricity or, you know, a place to land, so. What have you been working on this session, Marcy? I have been working on modernizing Vermont's bottle bill, H-158. It would expand the scope of the universe of containers that are covered by that five cent deposit in Vermont, which currently includes uh, carbonated beverages like soda and beer, as well as liquor at a 15 cent deposit. This bill proposes to expand it to cover beverages like bottled water, wine, sports drinks, iced coffee and tea, and basically everything else. Cool. And so where does that money go, the five cents? Does it, yeah, how does that work? How does that funding mechanism work? It's a great question. I think a lot of folks get confused about it. So the five cents is actually kind of passed circularly. Um, it's a deposit, it's a refundable deposit, and no one actually ever pays it and kind of just gets passed from person to person as an incentive to recycle. Um, what the um, cost of recycling is within the bottle bill is a fee called the handling fee, which is paid by beverage manufacturers like Coca-Cola to redemption centers or others that redeem to cover the cost of recycling. That, so th when someone pays five cents for, th for the deposit and then doesn't return their five cents and get that deposit back, that's where those funds go? Or where, yeah, where, what happens when someone doesn't return their bottle? Yeah, so as of 2018, when folks don't return their bottle to get that five cent deposit back, it actually gets sheeted to the state and it goes to clean water funding.
yeah. Um, anything else that you've been working on this year that um, you've been excited to, yeah, to, to work on this session? Yeah, I worked on a bill in the Senate, uh, S-25, which would have banned a laundry list of toxic chemicals from uh, personal care products and period products. It also would have banned the class of PFAS, which are kind of a well-known uh, toxic chemical linked to exposure down in Bennington County a few years ago. It would have banned PFAS from artificial turf, um, as well as, um, thank you, artificial turf and all textiles, which is... Um, a bill that passed in California earlier this year. And so you're an advocate here. What's your role today? Are you like in the ear of legislators? Are you trying to push the, the bills that you're working on one way or another on the last day here? What, what are you up to? Yeah, so um, H-158, the modernization of the bottle bill, passed uh, third reading of the Senate yesterday. It had passed the House earlier this session. Really exciting win for the environment and for consumers. Um, now I'm here working on figuring out when it's gonna go back to the House for a concurrence vote. Um, it passed the House on a 115 vote earlier in the session, so we're really confident that it'll move smoothly sm through the House. It's just kind of a question of when. Brenda, can you just tell us why you're here at the State House today? Sure. Um, I'm here today because they are going to be voting on the budget. Um, the legislature is going to be voting on the budget, both the House and the Senate. Actually, they're going to be voting on the conference report, which is the compromise between the Senate and the House on the budget. Um, and right now, that conference report does not put the funding needed into emergency housing. There are 1,800 households and 2,800 individuals across the state uh, who will be unsheltered on June 1st and July 1st, and there is nowhere for them to go. Shelters are full, all of the other options are full, and this is going to be placed in our communities, which is not good for communities or in individuals. This really is an abject failure of our legislature to make sure that we protect the absolute most vulnerable people in our state. Over the last few weeks, I have gone to 16 hotels um, and visited with about a thousand of the people in the hotels and motels. The people exited will include 500 to 600 children. It'll include people on oxygen tanks. It'll include people with uh, who are wearing defibrillators and need to be near a uh, outlet. It'll be pe include people who used just had brain surgery. It'll include um, many single moms, people who have DCF involvement and a termination of parental rights will occur as a result of this. It will include um, many people in recovery and people with mental illness that are finally stabilized. And those things are not um, possible to keep stable while on the street. So we are really putting a lot of people's lives at risk. You mentioned that it's a humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with. Why do you think that the legislature and the governor um, have not come around to, to funding the program? You know, I don't understand it. I'm going to be really honest and say when we're looking at 2,800 individuals, 500 to 600 children being put on the street, I do not understand how you come to the conclusion that it's okay to unshelter people to the street. It's, it is in, in um, my understanding of how we should operate as human beings from a moral perspective and also from an economic perspective. This is going to have an incredible impact on our businesses, an incredible impact on our downtowns and our communities, on our health care providers, on our public safety. So even from an economic perspective, I don't really understand it. I think one thing that does happen is that people in poverty are very easily swept under the rug. And so these are really the most vulnerable people among us. Um, and so we're looking at a situation where um, it's easy to say, to dismiss the humanity of the people who we are causing suffering. So this, this is a, a humanitarian crisis and it is being caused by our legislature and the governor. So what are the options on the table for the legislature today to address the crisis that you're talking about? So there will be legislators that will vote no on the conference report, which is a really hard thing to do, and I want to really name that. This is a really brave action. This is work that a lot of them have done, all of them have done throughout the legislative session that is important to them on a lot of other issues. Um, but by voting no on the conference report, if it were to fail, then they'd have to go back and renegotiate that conference report 
report and therefore we'd have another opportunity to actually keep um, people inside. There's also a possibility for the two sides, the Senate and the House, to actually come together and say this is not going to work, it's not tenable, it's not politically tenable, it's not morally tenable, and so we have to fix it before we get there. I've seen that happen as well. Um, I don't expect it to today. Um, I expect us to walk out of here having made the decision to create a state-sponsored unsheltering of nearly 3,000 people. And I think another point I really want to add is that um, Vermont has the second highest rate of homelessness in the country right now, behind only California, and 80% of the people experiencing homelessness are utilizing the GA motel program. So this state-sponsored unsheltering is um, unsheltering 80% of the people in our state experiencing homelessness.